Hey up YouTube, Merry Christmas. So I'm back at you again with a, another bite size. Wow, I look yellow in that lens. I'm not drawn this, I hope. Anyway, what we're talking about today, I'm keeping my intro really short, is winter fruit tree pruning. So we'll roll the credits and I'll be right back. Okay, so what we're talking about when we talk about winter fruit tree pruning. Well, for the purpose of this video, you know, trying to keep them short, we're going to focus or we're going to talk about apple trees. Um, it's the one that is the most common on allotments and gardens, um, but the same principles apply to pretty much all your winter uh, fruit trees like your pears for example same principle same appearance really on the woods things like that so what we're going to do is we're going to refer to everything as if we're talking about apple trees but the same theory will apply to uh, your other winter fruit tree prunings like your pears so let's start with a nice little hypothetical I think this is the first time I've done this and we'll, we'll talk to you guys out there that have, for firstly that have just taken on a new allotment so you've just taken on your new allotment and you've inherited an apple tree what are you going to do what are you going to do um, you're not sure whether it's been looked after generally you'll be able to tell but so a lot of cases allotments unfortunately have, been, have, have laid dormant for at least a season or two before um, before action is taken to get a new tenant on. So what you need, where you need to start really is decide, is, is sort of stand back and look at the tree. I'll try and once again, I'll be trying to get images in where I can. Um, this video has been done in conjunction with Aaron. Um, he's provided me with some pictures and things like that. So we'll try and get those in where we can. Unfortunately, I haven't got any before and afters, but you start, sort of stand back, look at your tree, um, and think about what shape is going to best suit that tree or your needs. At the end of the day, a tree will be can be trained into any one of the three main types. Now, I'm not going to talk about a spellier or step over for the purposes of this video. We might cover that in the spring pruning stone fruit trees. It's, I believe, more applicable to them. Um, what we're going to focus on is central leader, modified leader, and open vase style, or as I call it, goblets, wine goblet style. Um, so you're looking at your tree, you've got, once again, I'll try and get images in, but you know, I'll do the whole handy thing as, uh, as some of you like or don't like. Um, you've got your central trunk leading up the tree. Now, in a central leader, that trunk will continue straight up and you'll have a branch, and then you'll go up a bit more, then a branch, then you'll go up a bit more and a branch, etc., etc. But you'll always just have that singular, I, I call straight, but you know, it's tree, nature doesn't grow in straight lines. But you'll have your central trunk and then you'll have branches coming off sporadically in, 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 with, with, your, with your fruit bearing, spurs on them then you'll have a modified leader which is very similar to open and vase uh, open vase style style where you'll have your central trunk but then at some point it will split generally into two but then you'll have your branches coming off the insides and the outsides of those splits and you try and maintain those two central splits with your with your branches coming off them which leaves you just sort of, almost like a fan arrangement. And then you've got the one that I advise for most home and garden growers. It's, it's, it requires a little bit more maintenance, but it means that your cropping is easier and your tree will generally be healthier, especially if you're in a fenced area or something that's slightly sheltered so that you, the tree can get plenty of airflow in and amongst the central growth. 
So what open VAR style is, it's kind of like modified leader, where you'll have a central trunk and then you'll have a split. Now that split can be two, three, four branches. It's, 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 that's not as important as the way that you prune the tree. What you try and do with the, with the tree is you try and prune, you try and remove all or majority of the growth on the inside. So essentially you're trying to create a hollow center which is where it allows your airflow. And you're trying to encourage growth coming off the outer sides or the outer edge, as it were. So you're trying to create an environment where your spurs are growing out and out and out and out. It will make for a bushier tree, but you, you have to remember that as you're pruning in years coming, once your wood's about over three years old, it's starting to decline in its fruit quality. So as you're pruning and pruning and pruning as years going by, you're taking off as much of the outer edge as it is producing. So you, apple trees and say other winter fruit tend to grow on second and third year wood the best. So you leave new wood. In fact, we're gonna to get to that. We're gonna to get to that. You're focusing on planning your shape of a, new, of, a, of a new inherited tree that you're not sure on. So you come up with your plan. I advise open vase style, which is what we're going to talk about. Central leader, modified central leader, are pretty much the same beyond that point. You just It's just your first initial decision on your shape of the tree. Now, if your tree looks as though it's been a central leader and you want to change it, or it's just been left to grow, and you want to change it from a central leader to a vase or a, or a modified open, which means that you need to encourage some branches to come out lower down and become main branches. Um, don't just lop off the top of the tree. Um, aim to reduce it down stage by stage gradually over the course of about three seasons, about three years. If you do it in one go, you can inadvertently remove all the new wood. Uh, and what that can happen, what, what can happen there is you can create a biannual tree, which means for at least a few years, you will only get fruit every other year because you've, renew you've removed all your year two growth or your year two and older inadvertently or you can have left just really old growth on the bottom portion of the tree so just be aware of that aim to reduce it down and always make your plan with regards to looking at doing things over the course of two three four years so you reduce it down section by section so once you've got your shape in mind sorry this is a very intense subject and i'm trying i, I appreciate i'm looking away from the camera but i am reading my notes You've got your shape in mind. Bear in mind that it, it could change because the next stage is to take off all the dead, diseased, broken wood. So anything that looks unhealthy, uh, anything that looks like it's got fungus on it, don't worry too much about um, lichen and, and mosses. They're not too much of a problem. Um, certainly fungal growth, um, anything where the bark is splitting, things like that you want to be looking to remove those. Any broken wood, and certainly any dead wood, anything that snaps really easily is dead. You know, where you can see where the, where, where the wood comes to a point where it's dead, try and go a couple of inches back from that, and that's where you're lopping off. Always remember, when lopping, pruning, whatever, you want good, clean secateurs. I use uh, Felco, they are pricey, but they're amazingly good quality you buy them once and they're something that can be taken apart maintained and cleaned year on year on year parts are always available so do do invest in a good pair of secateurs they're worth their weight in gold especially if you've got multiple trees that you're pruning so you take off all your, your your dead diseased wood now you need to be looking at where the fruit is coming from so now you need to be looking at your your fruit spurs and what these look like once again I'll try and get images in are essentially 
up and coming flower buds. They will be showing, they will be present on your trees at this time of year. So you can look at what you want to do with regards to your fruit spurs. Now in the majority of cases, you want to be taking a roundabout off the entire tree, around about 50 percent because in essence you don't know what what that tree produced the year before it could have fruited a lot and the fruit could have been brilliant or it could have produced hundreds and hundreds of little tiny apples like that which are no good to anybody so your best bet really is to cover all bases now when it comes to your spurs once again, I've got an image in here which Aaron has kindly um, edited for me. He only did a quick 10 second job of it, but I couldn't do any better. Um, when you're doing your spurs, you want to do a mixture, as you have done with your pruning, to get your, to get your shape of leaving old and new growth so that you're not creating a biannual tree, as we've already mentioned. So once again, images in hand, you'll see in the image that I'm putting up here that there is um, a spur. Now the spur has got a long shoot and then on, on, on one or two of them, you'll see there's a bit of the shoot, then there'll be a bud, and then there's a bit more shoot, and then there'll be the bud on the end. In some instances, you know, we take off the bud on the side and in some instances we take off the bud on the top and in some instances we take off the entire spur itself that is selecting new and old wood if you try and sort of apply that across your entire tree what you will do is you will end up with a tree that will not only be able to put on plenty of growth in the following season but the crop should be a lot better quality as well so once you've done your spurs and you've done all your, you've got your shape, you've taken your twigs off, you've taken your branches off, you've come up with your three year plan, so that, that is important. Your year one, it can look like you're pruning a lot, it, it can look like you're pruning a lot, but as you'll see in some of Aaron's, in some of the pictures from Aaron that I'm, put, I'm going to put in now, it does look quite severe it does um, and sometimes on an inherited tree that hasn't been looked after properly that's the way you've got to go unfortunately but in the long run you are going to benefit massively your crops are going to be better the quality is going to be better the tree is going to be more disease resistant because it's not trying to throw too much energy into producing fruit because bear, bear in mind generally speaking a, a, a produce bearing plant produces more fruit when it is under stress because essentially what it's trying to do is reproduce before it, it pops off before it's done so reducing that stress helping the plant to to be a bit more selfish by reducing the amount of fruit it can produce because if you take these spurs off now it's not going to have time to produce more for the coming season. So you'll set once again, you will end up providing you leave that mixture of new and old spurs, you will end up with a bit of fruit and but more importantly in years to come you're going to be rewarded with a stronger, healthier tree. And I just briefly want to talk about bare root trees now. The purpose of this particular bike size is to talk about older inherited trees or perhaps trees that you've inherited that somebody said I don't want it you know come and take it off my plot or whatever they are established trees bare root trees really they kind of need a video unto themselves um, there's, there's too many variable there's two main variants when you're buying a bare root tree and now is the time for them to be going in the ground you can t you get a feathered version which does lend itself to the novice and new gardener a lot easier um, and what you tend to find with a feathered version is you have your central trunk and you have some 
branches coming off the sides. And then you have what's called a whip. Now these are generally cheaper than feathered versions. Not all varieties of um, fruit tree will produce a feathered version. Um, but your whips tend to be cheaper. They tend to be a little younger. Um, the garden centre or nursery has had to do less to them, so that's why they tend to be cheaper. And what they tend to be is just one, essentially a stick. Essentially a stick. I mean, if you envisage a, a whip, you know, it's just one, one stick. Now, a whip can be trained can be trained into all the different varieties. You just have to identify a node, chop it, chop it off, and that will cause it to to send out extra branches. But like I said, I don't really want to go into these too much, um, as really they need a video to themselves. So if that is something you would like to see, do pop a comment in the, uh, in the, in the below and let me know. And if it is something you want to see, I will try and get one out in the coming weeks, if not next week. Also, whilst we're on the subject of rootstocks, or should I say um, bare root trees, or even transplanting or moving an existing established tree. A couple of things that I would like to mention with regards to, to putting them in the ground. Try and dig a hole. Now there's this thing going around about square holes at the moment being better for trees. It generates a bit more space, enables the roots to sort of spread out as opposed to becoming a ball. But that's not what I'm going to mention. What I'm going to mention is line the hole that you do dig, line it with plenty of compost. Compost or um, leaf mold will work. Please don't, uh, personally, I would say do not use manure. Once again, for a novice and new gardener, you can never be too sure how fresh that manure is. Now, if the manure goes in and it's too fresh, you risk fatally hurting the tree because as it breaks down it releases a lot of ni uh, nutrients nitrogen into the soil and also it does that at quite a high temperature so you can do what's called burning the roots which can prove fatal for the tree in the very least it can massively hinder the tree so you can think you're helping when you're not something like an organic matter compost or uh, leaf mold or um, a compost you've done yourself that is fully broken down, worm castings, that's perfectly fine. Please don't use a manure. Um, personal opinion there. A lot of people are going, might, may well disagree with that. Each to their own. That's my advice. Take it or leave it. Um, also, when it comes to bare root stocks, just once again, whilst we're on the subject, what a bare rootstock tends to be, and that's more suitable to allotment growers, is a grafted tree. What that tends to mean is they'll get a tree such as a, a cox's apple, and they'll grow that to a certain age, and then they'll grow something else. It can be, oh God, it can be a crab tree, something that's known to only grow small. Now I know some crab apple trees grow big, but for the sake of argument, and for the sake of having two names to play with, a crab apple and a cox. They'll grow them to a certain age. They'll lop off the coxes, they'll lop off the crab tree, and then they'll get the cox's stem and they'll basically stick it on top of the uh, crab tree roots. With about a foot of tree, of the uh, rootstock tree, then they'll, stick, they'll graft that on top. Now that is called grafted. And what that does is it means that the, the overall tree size is not going to be that big. It's going to generate a, a smaller tree, a dwarf tree, which is a lot more suitable for the home and allotment grower. In fact, a lot of allotments nowadays only allow dwarf trees. Now, point number one when you're growing these things is, or when you're planting them, and it is obvious, I mean, it is blatantly obvious. You'll notice in the bottom portion of the tree, there'll be a big nodule, a big sort of joint be generally a bit of a bulb, bulbous shape. Um, do not bury that portion of the tree. If you do, what it what it could cause happen is that's where the two trees have been joined, 
and you can find that your rootstock plant will grow and that what that's going to do is it's going to subtract because you're not the, the neutron it's taking the rootstock is taking out the ground to grow itself isn't going into your tree the one that you want it to grow so be aware of that don't bury below, below the loop, root bah, below the joint couple of uh, rootstock names to look out for because they tend not to be named they tend to have a code associated with them it's M27 that's M for mother M9 and M106 they're, you, they're three good dwarf rootstocks but back on to uh, a bit of winter tree fruit tree prep now this really applies to all the trees and in actual fact majority of your fruit bushes going into winter and that is give them a good mulching so whether they're old trees new trees they give them a good mulching it doesn't matter which once again as I've already said I personally wouldn't use a manure I would use spent compost I would use ideally leaf mold and what I would do if I had leaf mold is I'd, I'd put a good lump of leaf mold because I mean it breaks down to next to nothing and then I'd put spent compost on top of it now your leaf mold ideally wants to be shredded otherwise you will encourage um, undesirable insects like moths like slugs so if that if you can get it shredded brilliant in a bucket pair of um, shears chop 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 dump that on bit of compost on top and that'll just stop it all from blowing away it means that you haven't wasted your time give it a good soak jobs are good and what that does is it suppresses your weeds through spring which is crucial for, for especially for new fruit trees and establishing fruit trees they don't like weed competition um, the roots are very shallow the roots are very new and they're looking for food so if you've got dandelions and thistles growing and I mean they, they can grow a few feet under the ground then you, the, the tree's missing out on those nutrients so it will help suppress any weed growth and also perhaps more importantly it will feed that tree as it's waking up as it's coming out of dormancy out of winter dormancy that food is there and it's available for the tree when it needs it and then obviously going into spring summer fruiting you still want to be feeding that tree I use a liquid um, seaweed fertilizer it's, a, it's an all-rounder personally that's what I use it's a DOF liquid seaweed it's my favorite I use it for everything and that's what I use I used to um, give my trees my fruit trees a good feed once every two weeks other than that in dry climates a good watering but at once every two weeks it would get a full can with a full cans dose of liquid feed you could also I suppose use things like grow more granules when you're planting it doesn't hurt to throw some um, blood fish and bone in things like that are all handy little uh, little things that the tree will thank you for in the long run and at the end of the day if you've got a happy tree you're gonna get you're gonna be happy because it's gonna get bigger better tasting fruit and honestly an apple that you pick an apple a pear that you pick off the tree bite into there and then nothing in the shops compares absolutely nothing in the shop compares so put the work in when you first either inherit your tree or when you first buy your tree get the work in then once you've done your work for two three years you'll find that the pruning not only becomes second nature but you actually need to do less of it you start to train the tree so get that working in the first few years have your three-year plan and you should be good you should be good you should be rewarded with fruit plenty of it and also a tree that requires less work so hopefully it's quite an intense topic and I know there is stuff that I've missed and for that I apologize um, I mean you could go on about this subject for for an hour which is why I've sort of glided through we've focused on 
winter trees only. We've focused on an inherited older tree only. Um, and we've kind of talked about apple, but remember that a lot of these principles can be applied to at most, if not all, of your winter, winter pruning fruit trees, such as your apples and pears. Please remember, any stone fruits or pears, uh, pears, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, you should not be pruning them in winter. They should always be pruned mid spring and then again mid to late summer if they need it. That is something that we are going to talk about in springtime. We will, I think, uh, I think in actual fact, I think Aaron might be doing that video. I don't know. Um, he might be doing that. He's got far more experience with me uh, than me. My um, stone fruit trees are still being trained, so. And I know I realise after speaking to him that I have made some mistakes, but that's why I produce these videos. It's why I talk to people like Aaron. It's why I do the research to try and condense it down to these little small bite-sized packages for you. And we just go over the basics. I'm not. I don't go into too much depth. Um, so yeah, that should be your fruit trees um, maintained at least for this winter, like I say, three year plan. Have that in the back of your mind, take some pictures and, uh, and, and try and uh, not massacre your tree in the first year, especially if it's a large, well-established one. Do it in phases. You, know, you, you can bring a massive out of control tree. You can rein them in without sacrificing a few years worth of crops. You can just do it gradually. So don't go at it like a bull in a china shop more importantly your most important thing is to remove all of the um, dead and diseased wood focus on that get that right then maybe perhaps leave your crop leave your spurs maybe um, but I, I, I wouldn't I don't think you can do provided you don't remove all of them and you look at removing 50% of them I don't think you can you can damage your tree. I don't think you can send it biannual. So I wouldn't worry too much about it and it is something that I would try and do. What I'm gonna do, the notes that I've written for this video, if I can tidy them up enough, I'm gonna stick them down in the description. They will also be available as a document over in the Conversation Shed Facebook group, so please do head over there. Um, it's a community after all. We're all out there to help each other. If you like these videos, drop a drop a like and a subscription, and subscribe, like and subscribe. Um, if you'd like to help me with the bite size with with the bite size videos, if you'd like to know a particular thing, yeah, if you'd like me to discuss a particular thing, look into a particular thing, put it in the comments below. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I am leaning towards talking about bare root um, planting and setting up in the next video, but we'll see, we'll see. I'm gonna throw this out there on Facebook. I would love for you to comment in the comments below this video. Tell me what you would like me to do next. Um, I know, because it's, it's a case of trying to do what's on people's minds. So I've got a lot of people at the moment, for some reason are, talk, are, are, are focusing on pests and things like that. So. You know, drop me a message below, let me know what you'd like me to do. So with that all being said, hopefully I've portrayed everything properly. So until next time, I'll see you later.